The following is an EWTN special presentation. Uh, now we continue with our theme of uh, faith and beauty, theology and beauty, with Joseph Pierce. Uh, Joseph Pierce is the uh, writer in residence at Aquinas uh, College in Nashville. Uh, many of you uh, probably know him from his many books uh, that he's written on Shakespeare, G.K. Chesterton, J.R.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, um, and uh, Solzhenitsyn, and of course, uh, uh, for um, for those of you who are uh, Tolkien fans, I mean, he's written some beautiful things on the internet there on Tolkien, myth, and, and faith. He's uh, talked about uh, Shakespeare and Catholicism, a variety of other things that really bring us much closer to our faith uh, through literature. Uh, he has, uh, you know, uh, also uh, done uh, many appearances on television, I don't have to tell you. Uh, and we're just lucky to have him with us today. He's going to be talking about how literature helps us to form character or Christian character. So, Joseph, a privilege having you here. Thank you, Father Spitzer, and uh, it's a privilege to be here. Um, this is obviously a very new initiative, um, the Napa Institute, but I think any Catholic who's engaged with their faith already knows about it. It's certainly a privilege for me to be invited uh, this morning. So yes, how literature shapes the Christian character? Well, I'd like to sort of begin, perhaps, by um, talking about an analogy, or if you like, a metaphor, or if, if you like, a, um, a, th a philosophical, rational way of seeing the Trinity. Because the Greek philosophers before the incarnation came up with the, the idea of the good, the true, and the beautiful, and how the good, the true, and the beautiful ultimately were three and yet one, that the good always leads to the true and the beautiful, the true leads to the good and the beautiful, and the beautiful leads to the good and the true. So they should be seen as one. And I think that one of the problems we have is that there's a certain tendency to see the beautiful as sort of like a trailer that's tagged on behind faith and reason or tagged on behind the good and the true, it's an optional extra, which we can sort of disengage if we like. And I would really like to stress that, on the contrary, um, that uh, it's like the Trinity, and you can't leave beauty out of the picture any more than you can leave the Holy Spirit out of the picture. And I also want to talk about how literature, if anything, and the arts in general, and literature in particular, are more important now, perhaps, uh, as a tool of evangelization than they've ever been. And that's because of the culture in which we live. If we want to talk about the good, the true, and the beautiful, the good, virtue, can ultimately be summed up in the one word, love. The problem is, however, that the modern world has narcissistically inverted the very meaning of love. So love, of course, for the Christian is to lay down our lives for the beloved, to give ourselves self-sacrificially for the other. Love is inseparable from sacrifice, self-sacrifice. But for the modern world, love is really about feeling. It's about feeling good. If you make me feel good and I make you feel good, we're in love. As soon as you stop making me feel good, I'll move on and find someone who does. Now that sort of narcissistic, self-centered understanding of love makes it very difficult to talk about love. Of course, real love, sanctity, speaks more powerfully than anything else. You know, if you want to evangelize the culture, all that you have to do is become saints. It's easy. I became a saint last Tuesday. You should try it. <laughs> of course, it isn't easy. But the more, the more holy we become, 
the more virtuous we become, which basically means the more self-sacrificial we become in giving ourselves to others, the more we will bring people to Christ. It's a fact. But we can't talk about love anymore because, or very easily in this culture because the very meaning of the word love has been changed. Now, what John Lennon means by love is not the same thing that Jesus Christ means by love. And the so-called summer of love of the hippies in the 1960s was narcissistic. It ends up in narcotics. It's not the same thing as Christian understanding of love. So that's the good. Virtue, love. The true, of course, is reason. And the Catholic Church has rightly and always insisted in the marriage, the indivisible union, indissoluble union, between faith and reason. The true reason always leads to God, because God, of course, is the reason. He's the source of all reason, and all reason leads to him. So always the Catholic Church needs to teach truly in terms of its theology and its philosophy and an understanding of history and the sciences. One thing we need to say here, by the way, to keep clear in our minds, the medieval understanding of science was a much better understanding. Scientia, knowledge, theology was the queen of the sciences. What we now call science was called natural philosophy, the love of wisdom that we can learn through nature. And, it's, and that's natural philosophy that we now call science is a true, good uh, path of reason that leads towards God. But the third in this trinity, and I'm going to keep insisting on it as a trinity, is the beautiful. And again, we sometimes think of, I think we misunderstand beauty as something passive. We look at a painting. We listen to a piece of music. We read a book. But really, you know, at its deepest, beauty is not something passive, but something very, very active. Because if we love, because God is love, and it's the image of God in us, to want love and to want to love, and if we reason, because God is reason, therefore it's natural for us to reason, to be rational. It's also very natural for us to desire the beautiful, not just because God is beautiful, but because he's the creator. God is, well, not an artist, God is the artist. And what you use in the arts is your imagination, image in the image of God in us as a creator. Or as Tolkien said, made a very, very important and crucial distinction between creation and sub-creation. God is the creator. He is the only one that can make something from nothing. Ex nihilo. We are sub-creators. We make things from other things that already exist. So a landscape artist, for instance, will take paintbrushes, oils or watercolors, an easel, uh, a canvas, his eyes, his hands, the grass, the buildings, the cows, the clouds, the sun, light, and put all these things together that already exist and make something new. And the way that he does that is to use his imagination, and his imagination is the image of God in him, as love is the image of God in him. So in that sense, the beautiful is something we're all called to do. As we're called to love, as we're called to reason, we're also called to be creative. Now, I would say that, to go back to the title of the talk, how literature shapes the Christian character, to define our terms, that the Christian character can be defined in terms of the good, the true, and the beautiful. The Christian character should have those three components as its animating force. Virtue, love, 
reason, and creativity. A love for the, be for the beautiful, a desire for the beautiful, and the doing of the beautiful. Now, I know some of you might be thinking, well, that's fine for the artist, but I can't paint, I can't draw, I can't write, I can't sing. Well, I can tell you I can't draw and I can't sing, but it doesn't stop me doing it, because doing it's good. And uh, Chesterton once said something that scandalized me when I was younger. Chesterton said, if a thing is worth doing, it's worth doing badly. <laughs> and I thought, that's outrageous. My father always taught me, if a thing is worth doing, it's worth doing well. And now Chesterton is telling me the opposite. But I knew enough of Chesterton at this, by this stage that, to know that Chesterton was smart. <laughs> and that Chesterton was smarter than me. And that perhaps in thinking that Chesterton wrong, was wrong, I might actually be wrong. So I thought about it a bit more. And then I realized, of course, that the paradox is that both are true. If a thing is worth doing at all, it's worth doing well. Yes. But if a thing is worth doing well, worth doing at all, it's worth doing badly. Yes. And let me give you one perfect example of this. The greatest football player in the world, and obviously I'm talking about the real game of football, not that thing you play over here. The greatest football player in the world, when he was two years old and first kicked the ball, fell flat on his face and made his parents laugh. He was doing it badly. And if we don't start doing something badly, we're never going to do it well. And if something's good to do, let's do it. Again, a paradox. I think it was one of Chesterton's again. He said, Protestants are always saying that they're good Protestants. Catholics are always saying that they're bad Catholics. <laughs> the point is, we know that we could be doing it better. We know that we should be doing it better. But until we're not going to start doing it better until we continue doing it badly. If we stop doing it at all, we've had it. So, the Christian character is to have the good, the true, and the beautiful as something we're practicing, doing. Literature, to define our terms, I would say is the good, the true, and the beautiful in the power of words. Now, some of you would say, quite rightly, being devil's advocates, what about the bad literature? There's an awful lot of bad literature out there. Well, there's two types of bad literature. In fact, there's four types of literature. There's good, good literature. There's bad, good literature. There's good, bad literature. And there's bad, bad literature. <laughs> now, something can be good as art, but bad as morality. Um, something can be good as morality and bad as art. Really, really bad Christian novels. But the point is that we are given talents by God. And they're gifts. And those gifts are given to be used. God does not remove the gift merely because we abuse it. So if we're given great artistic talent, great literary talent, and we produce something which is great as art but bad as morality... God doesn't strike us down dead. He allows us to carry on. And the best analogy would be the other gift that we all have, the gift of life. If God removed the gift of life the first time we abused it, I'd be the only one in here now. So literature is something which conveys, or at least should convey, the good, the true, and the beautiful with the power of language. And I want to just quickly talk about two general uh, 
types of literature, and of course, no, there's no real time to talk about any of this at any length. One type of literature, which is not read as much now as it should be, is lyrical poetry, and Tolkien said that nature is a study for eternity, for those so gifted. In other words, we don't just see nature and study nature as nature, although that's good, that would be science. We study nature as something which reflects the goodness, truth, and beauty of God, that shows us the eternal. So, for instance, Coleridge, in his hymn before sunrise in the Vale of Chamonix, has a vision of the sun rising above Mont Blanc in the Alps and is moved to a hymn of praise to God. The mountain itself is singing praise to God in the beauty of the sunrise changing its color. More deeply, perhaps, Gerard Manley Hopkins, in his poem, The Wreck of the Deutschland, looks at a shipwreck where one quarter of those on the shipwreck are killed, including five Franciscan sisters. And he asked the the question, well, what's it all about? What sort of God would allow this to happen? These five Franciscan sisters are already being exiled from Germany. And they're on their way to the United States. They end up being shipwrecked off the coast of England and are killed. But Hopkins reads this newspaper report of one of the nuns, a tall nun, who stands up basically proclaiming the gospel, praying, calling people to Christ. And he sees the presence of God in that shipwreck that the suffering was itself a way of God bringing souls to him that may have been damned otherwise because of the witness of this nun. The other type of literature, the one that's, that we, we read more of, is story. Now, story comes from Christ himself in the sense that History is his story. Our lives are a story. We're part of the bigger story. The life of Christ, as the the Hollywood movie proclaims, was the greatest story ever told. Of course, it's the greatest story ever lived. And Christ has himself sanctified literature. Because not only, of course, is his life the greatest story ever told. How does Christ teach so many of his most powerful lessons? He teaches it through story, through parables, through fiction. Let me say something that might seem shocking here. That the prodigal son didn't exist. He was a figment of our Lord's imagination. A fabrication, not a fact. The prodigal son did not exist, and nor did his father, nor did his brother, and nor for that matter did the pigs. (laughs) None of them existed. They were a work of art, a story told by Jesus Christ. And yet that story is so powerful that for 2,000 years, whenever people have heard it, They've seen something of themselves in the prodigal son. They've seen something of themselves in the envious brother and hopefully of the forgiving parent. So the evangelizing power of literature has been sanctified and sanctioned and made bona fide by Jesus Christ himself. And I want to just finish with a practical example, just a practical example. Well, first of all, two. One's one's a movie, so it's not technically on topic, but uh, you'll forgive me. Mel Gibson's film, The Passion of the Christ. I went to see that when it first came out in a movie theater in Florida and got in my car afterwards, and I usually don't turn the radio on, but for some reason I turned the radio on. And Providence or what have you, found myself in a Protestant talk show. And they were all talking amongst themselves and saying they they never realized how close Mary was to Jesus during the Passion until they saw that film. 
Now, part of me, not the part of me that's going to get me to heaven, <laughs> went, duh. <laughs> and in case you, you, know, you all were laughing, so my wife would say, you're not going to heaven for as long as you find that funny. <laughs> but the Catholic Church had been trying through its theology, through its reason, to convince the Protestants for 300 years of the importance of the Mother of God and the sufferings of the Blessed Virgin in seeing the crucifixion of her son. But it took a work of art, a moving icon of the way of the cross, to bring it home to them. Now the other is the Lord of the Rings. Since well, the Lord of the Rings was the most popular book of the 20th century. Since Peter Jackson's film, I've been giving talks all over the place, unlocking the Lord of the Rings. And I've spoken at Ivy League schools and at state universities. And three or four hundred undergraduates are there at Princeton, Harvard, Iowa State, Cleveland State, etc., to listen to Unlocking the Lord of the Rings. And what they get for 45 or 50 minutes is unadulterated Catholic theology. Because Tolkien said, and I'm quoting him now, the Lord of the Rings is, of course, a fundamentally religious and Catholic work. So you say, for instance, you imagine now, imagine now you're not the good and worthy people at the Napa Institute. Imagine you're undergraduates at Princeton, heaven forbid. And I'm saying to you, on what day, on what date was the ring destroyed? And you look, and I say to you, it was destroyed on March the 25th. And because you're a Princeton undergraduate, you, you look at me and go, huh? So then you make it a bit easier. What happens nine months after March the 25th? April, May, June, July, August. December 25th. Santa Claus comes down the chimney. <laughs> now, things aren't that bad, even at Princeton. Jesus was born. Okay. Now, one thing you don't have to tell undergraduates at Princeton or state universities is about the facts of life. They understand that. So what happened nine months before Jesus was born? Oh, um, ah. And then you say, well, because life begins at conception and not at birth, the Annunciation is a more important date than Christmas. Because it's on the Feast of the Annunciation that God becomes man. It's on the Feast of the Annunciation that the Word becomes flesh. In fact, my one complaint against Holy Mother Church is that March the 25th is not a Holy Day of Obligation. I'm going to start a campaign. <laughs> so, and then you say, why? So what's the connection then between March the 25th and the crucifixion? Well, March the 25th is also the date on which the crucifixion happened. Now, that's something maybe some of us don't know. Because, of course, Good Friday is a movable feast. But the crucifixion happened once in history, on one day. And tradition has always had it that it happened on March the 25th, which is why it was New Year's Day in some medieval cultures. The Feast of the Annunciation and the Crucifixion are on the same day. And by the way, if you say, how do we know that? How can we know what day it happened on? Well, I know the day on which my parents died. Do you think that the Blessed Virgin forgot the day on which her son died? Or that St. John the Evangelist was not aware of the day of the crucifixion? or the other apostles that ran away, do not remember on what date it happened. So, of course, it went down in history. We've sort of largely forgotten it because we have the feast moving around all over the place. But it happened once in history on that date. Tolkien knew that. Tolkien was a medievalist. March the 25th, the date of the crucifixion and the date of the Annunciation, taken together with the, with the resurrection, is our redemption. What's destroyed on that date? Original sin. 
We're saved from sin. So what does that make the ring? The ring is synonymous with sin. Then you say to these undergraduates, what happens when you put the ring on? Well, you become invisible. No, you don't. You become invisible in this good world that God made, the world of the good, the true, and the beautiful. But you become more visible to Sauron, the dark lord, because you've entered his world. And if you continue to put the ring on, you begin to fade. You become like Gollum. And what a perfect depiction of the shriveling of the human soul, once addicted to sin. So you see here the power to evangelize the culture that literature has, the power to shape character. Those students, thousands of them now, over the years, have left listening to a talk about the Lord of the Rings with an understanding of the life, death, and resurrection, the resurrection of Christ, the destructive power of sin, the addictive quality of sin, which would not have been possible otherwise. Now just think about this. What about, instead of unlocking the Lord of the Rings, I had given a talk on campus on unlocking the gospel. Instead of 300 people turning up, 20 people may have turned up, 18 of which were the local Catholic and Protestant kids, and two might have been generally searching. And of course, it'd be worth giving the talk for, for that. But 300, when you evangelize through the power of beauty, so, I just want to finish with asking all of us to go forth and evangelize the culture in the name of the good, the true, and the beautiful. Thank you very much. Well, you can see why his articles are so popular, but uh, honestly, uh, Joseph, thank you very, very much for that uh, great presentation. And truly, we know the power of literature uh, uh, in our own lives uh, to catalyze the good, the true, and the beautiful, and especially in, th in those authors where truth itself and goodness itself and beauty itself are all catalyzing each other in the imaginations of the great Tolkien, the great C.S. Lewis, the great Solzhenitsyn, and of course, the great G.K. Chesterton, the great Shakespeare. Thank you, you really have made a, a real great synthesis and an evangelization tool for us today.